All right, well, welcome to Kansas City. Thanks Thank for being here. Thank you, Sean. I'm glad to be here. Let's just have a, a few questions for you, if you don't mind. The gateway to uh, Mission, Kansas. Right. Kansas City. Right. <laughs> okay, number one. Uh, like many of us, we, we got our start either with a, a magic set for Christmas or we saw a, a magician perform at a birthday party. How did you get your, your start? In well, it's strange. My dad did a trick, and he's not a magician, and it was, where he pulled off his thumb. And he wouldn't tell me how he did it. So I, I went to the library and I checked out books on magic and I found that trick in a book and I learned how to do it. So <laughs> inadvertently, he started me on a career. <laughs> Very nice. He really, nice. Wanted me, I really, uh, he really wanted me to be a biologist. I learned about flatworms and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, your big influences, did you, did you happen to meet Di Vernon? Or? Yes, I did. I, I met Di Vernon. I, I studied with Vernon. and. and Slidini, uh, and uh, I have the uh, one of the uh, privileges of being one of the very few people my age to actually give a magic lesson to the professor. Ooh, nice. Well, that's a bad way of putting it. <laughs> he actually wanted to, to ask me how to do a particular trick that I did. It was a stunt called the boomerang rubber band, and so it was more like sharing. You know, uh, he taught me a lot of stuff through the years, but I showed him how to do the boomerang rubber band in private. So now that he's gone, he's not going to say anything. It's kind of true. I gave a magic lesson to the professor, but I wouldn't really put it that way. That's awesome. I was actually going to ask you about the boomerang rubber band because I saw Chris Kenner do it. Yes. And he said uh, you showed him how to do that. Can you go into a little bit of the history about the boomerang rubber band? Well, we've written up the history, which, of, which we don't know the true history of the boomerang rubber band. Uh, you can actually, I still sell it for like $5 for the manuscript and some rubber bands. Chris Kenner teaches it on the Theory 11 website. Right. So you can go there and find it for free, but it still takes a little practice. Um, he learned it uh, from me and a friend of mine is Paul Spinago. I taught Paul and I taught Michael Weber. Michael Weber uh, had it published in, um, I think it was in Games Magazine or Omni Magazine and it attributed to Michael Weber, but it's not really his. Uh, it was shown to me by a magician in Knoxville by the name of Don Cox. And he learned it from his brother-in-law, a non-magician. The best we can figure out, back in the days of the IBM punch cards and running programs off of these key punch cards, and they'd run the batches and programs, wrap them with rubber bands, and they'd have to compile and run these, debug these programs at night. And it took forever with these programs. So they were programmers in there waiting on the big computer to compile their programs, and they had these rubber bands, and they were making up all sorts of weird games. So we think probably it was invented at IBM as a game, as a stunt. We're not sure. That's our best <laughs> guess. The history of the boomerang rubber band. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh, going back to uh, influences growing up, do you have any non-magical influences? Oh, yes. Uh, science fiction writers, um, Ray Bradbury, who just died, and uh, Robert A. Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, I was really I always wanted to be an astronomer. I was never really wanting to be a magician. It was just a hobby. And it turned out to be a profession, which is a lucky break for me. But I was interested in science and astronomy and science fiction. And now a lot of that inspires my magic. So that, that's a good thing. Reading of any type is good. Studying and learning anything is good because you learn how to learn no matter what you're going to do. You, you never stop learning. So if you go to school, you learn how to, to study a particular subject, whatever it is, then it makes you easier to learn magic, easier to learn anything on your own because you have the skills of how to do that. A lot of people tell you you need to go to school and they don't tell you why. Well, that's one of the big whys for doing that. Cool. Take some theater courses too. <laughs> so, books or DVDs? I like books, but then DVDs will show you timing and, and all. If you learn from a DVD, you're going to be copying a lot of the style of the creator. If you learn from a book, you inherently put your own style and your own thoughts and you become more creative learning from a book. So in the long run, the book's going to help you more than the DVD. The DVD was, is a quick way to learn something, but the long way, if you're really serious about your magic and you want to be different, you got to learn from books or a mentor, even better. Awesome. So, of course, you were past national president of the Society of American Magicians. Oh, thanks for remembering. Yes. <laughs> I spent that money a long time ago. Also the Burger King money I spent. Good. Uh, do you have a favorite part of, of running the oldest and most prestigious magic organization? I think it was prestigious because uh, I was holding the same office 
that Harry Houdini did, and I never really got over that that uh, awesome sense of history, a lot of great uh, history in that. So yes, just representing them the best I could, and I, I tried in my term to not to increase the membership, but to increase the quality of members that we were bringing in. So I was trying to uphold the overall quality of the art of magic while I was in the office. I enjoyed that. Very well done. Thank you for your time. Okay. Appreciate it. Sean, thanks very much. Cool.